Hello and welcome to this week's edition of our live Bible study. We are studying how to make choices you won't regret. It's one of our 40 minute studies and uh, we are delighted that you have joined us today. You know these studies are topical, they're not difficult to lead. Um, if you want to meet with other people we would encourage you to do that or they're just perfect for your own devotions and you can use them in many different types of contexts. And in fact tomorrow morning you are leading up to about 40 men um, in a study. You're looking at the, the title is Understanding Spiritual Gifts and uh, what's yeah. more it's a fantastic way to raise up uh, other leaders, Bible study leaders, small group leaders and um, so uh, yeah it's very good to use with men, women's groups, mums and toddlers, by yourself these are fantastic studies so make sure you get yourself a copy of the study and you'll be able to follow along with us. If you haven't got a copy don't worry get your Bible mm. and uh, you will need a pencil as well and then we're going to lead you through uh, the study. We're on week five at the moment we've been looking at the um, people in the Bible, so we've been looking at uh, David, King David, and the choices that he made and the consequences of the choices that he made. Uh, we've been looking at King Josiah, who was a very young king and how he chose to make godly decisions and it had such an impact on his own life and on the lives of those in uh, Judah. Despite his heritage. Despite his heritage, absolutely right. And so this week we're looking, we're going to be moving, um, well actually we're going back in time, aren't we? We're going to be looking at Adam and Eve. Um, anyway, would you like to pray and then we will get started. Yeah. Lord, thank you for uh, this time that we have together to meet, Lord. Um, thank you for your precious son. Thank you for your empowering Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word, Lord. Father, as we just pause before we start this study, we just ask that you'd help us to put, a, put aside whatever may be trying to distract us at the moment and help us to focus on you and what you want to teach us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're in week five of the study and uh, I'm just going to read a little introduction. That would be on page 48. Um, so let me get straight on with it. How, how do you respond when faced with temptation? Now there's a question. How do you decide what to do? One way we can learn to make wise choices is by observing the examples of those who have gone before us. Let's look at the first choice ever made by a human being when faced with temptation. Then we will observe how Jesus faced temptation. On what basis did he base his responses and how did they differ from those of Adam and Eve? And this is going to be a really, really great study to learn from. Uh, so here we go. Uh, to examine the first choice made uh, by a human being in response to temptation, we must go to Genesis chapter 2. So we're going to read Genesis chapter 2 verses 15 to 17 and we're going to underline every reference to man and we're going to put a tombstone, if you can imagine like a tombstone, over all references to the word die. So here we go, Genesis 2, 15, 17. Then the Lord God took the man. So underline man. And put him. Him. Into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man. Underline man saying, From any tree of the garden you, you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you, you shall not eat. For in the day that you, you eat from it, you, you will surely die. So put your tombstone over the word die. Okay, probably well-known scriptures to you. Um, so let's have a look at uh, this in a bit more detail. So to the man to whom God was speaking was Adam, the man that he created from the dust of the earth. What did you learn from marking references to the man? So again, having marked it, those of you that have been with us for a while will know exactly what we're doing here. Those of you that are new to this uh, may think it's a little bit strange. But having marked references to the man, it's very simple to then go back and uh, pick out those references and see what we learned. So, so what did we learn? So we learned that it was God who took the man. So he was taken and he was placed into the Garden of Eden. 
and uh, he was given a purpose there, wasn't he? He was given work to do. He had to cultivate it, he had to keep it, um, and then he was given some freedom in that um, there was some, there was a, a, a yes you can do and there was a no you cannot do. So we see that the man was uh, allowed to eat from any tree of the garden, but from one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he was not allowed to eat. So there was some freedom, but there were some boundaries as well. Yeah. And it was God who put him there. And warnings. Warnings, warnings yeah. yeah. So man and God lived in perfect oneness. It's top of page 50 now mm -hmm. in the book. Uh, one thing and only one thing was forbidden to the man. What was that one thing that was bidden, forbidden to him? But, that word but signifies that contrast, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. So that was what was forbidden him. He wasn't to eat from that particular tree, but from any of the other trees, he could eat freely. Okay. So was man given a choice in respect to his relationship with God, and what was it? So... Yeah, I think he was. He was given a choice. He was given a choice to obey God's command, to obey God's word, or not. That was what Absolutely, he was given yeah. a choice to do. And were there any consequences to his choice? Mm. And was this made plain to him? Explain I think, your answer. I think this is where the little tombstone co comes in, so mm. we can see mm. that's at the end of verse 17. Um, and so, yeah, the consequences are for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So I think, yes, he, the, the, the Lord told him specifically, in the day that you eat from it, you shall die. So Adam was warned about um, the, the time, the consequence was death, so it was all very clear. I think also, let's go back to verse 16, it says, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. And so there was huge freedom for him any tree I mean, just imagine them looking beautiful trees with great fruit uh, but there was just one tree he couldn't and uh, so so let's move on as we've seen God placed Adam and Eve his wife into a garden referred to as the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 verse 23 they lived in freedom with only one restriction sounds simple enough doesn't it let's see how they responded mm. so we're going to read Genesis 3 1 to 6 and we're going to underline all the references to woman. We're going to put a pitchfork over the word serpent. And once again, we're going to mark uh, dying with a tombstone. So, woman, serpent, and dying. Genesis 3, 1 to 6. Here we go. Now, the serpent. So, serpent, mark that with your pitchfork. Was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And. He. He, the serpent, said to the woman... So underline the woman. Indeed, has God said... You, the woman... Shall, you shall not eat from the tree of the garden. The woman, the woman said to the serpent... Mark the serpent. From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. Top of page 51, verse 3. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said... You, you shall not eat from it. Or touch it, or you. you will die. So put your tombstone over die. The serpent, okay, Mark the serpent. said to the woman, woman, you, you surely will not die. Mark the tombstone. For God knows in the day that you, you eat from it, your, your eyes will be opened. And you... You will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she, she took from its fruit and ate. And she, she gave also to her, her husband with her, her and he Eight. So we're not working out there. Okay, so top of page 51, first question. What did you learn from marking references to the serpent? So we've got a few, a few of those references. So he was described in verse 1 as being more crafty than any beast of the field. Uh, and we learned that he was made, and he was made by the Lord God. So he was a created um, beast. Yep. Uh, we also see in verse 1 that he spoke uh, and that he spoke to the woman 
And uh, in, in, in speaking to her, we see he's got a tactic, and his tactic was to question God's word. Because he said, indeed, has God said so? He's putting doubt in, into the woman's mind. So right from the word go, um, he's kind of putting doubt into the, um, whether God's word can be obeyed and trusted and believed. Yeah. And, and just to, I mean, just to say, that's his tactic today. Isn't mm, it hasn't changed. So it's exactly the same with us today. Mm. To put doubt into your mind, into my mind, that actually this, this isn't the word of God, yeah. or, or may contain the word of God. You don't really need to have to live by this. And it puts doubt, sows doubt in our mind. And we see that right from the get-go. And that's what's so interesting, isn't it, about, or vital, not interesting, about understanding and learning how he operates because, as you said, things haven't changed. And so he, he will, um, yeah, act in the same way. Anyway, so uh, we also learn uh, about the serpent. Let's have a look. Where else did we learn? Okay, so if we go up to uh, verse 4, um, we see that he says, you surely will not die. So he actually refutes God's word. I mean, having put doubt in her mind in verse 1, he now just flat out says, you're not going to die. Yeah. Totally refutes what God says. Yeah. Um, and then I think we also learn something more about him in verse 5. Uh, he, he kind of makes God out to be a spoil sport. Um, for God knows that in the day you'll eat, from it your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. It's almost as if he's saying, you know, God's holding something back from mm -hmm. you. So he's, um, yes, he, he's, he's, he's making God out to be a real spoil sport as well. Yeah. Okay, so next question, what did you learn from marking references to the woman? A woman, right. Well, look at verse 2. Um, we see that she actually responds and gets into a conversation with uh, the serpent. Um, and then we also see in verse 3, we marked her in verse 3, she said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And that sounds to me as though she's adding yes. a little bit to what yes. God said. Yeah, um, so interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Because God didn't say the word touch it. No. He did say you should not eat from it, but he didn't say touch it. And, and in a sense, you, you get the impression that um, she's putting that extra bit in there, making it a possibility that she could touch it. That's the way that I think, mm, I interesting. think um, I'm thinking. Literally I may be completely off base there, but she's putting the word touch in there as if to say, oh, there's temptation there. I've been told not to touch it, but I might touch it. I could touch it. Yes, you know? yes, you interesting. So she adds to God's word. And then I think um, another thing that we see is that she listens to the serpent. So verse 6, so when the woman. And so we, we know that um, she actually listens to him. And we'll talk about the consequences of that in a minute, what she does. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I, th I think that is so interesting as well, just that simple thing, listening to him, listening to what he's saying and trying to make things out better than they actually are and the warnings that God's put down are not valid and actually it just raises the whole question of whose voice are we listening to? Mm. Are we listening to God's voice or are we listening to Satan's voice? And you know we're talking, it's a book about making choices and um, I think as we're going through the book one of the things that we're seeing is going to help us make wise choices is to listen to what God says rather yes. than what Satan says yeah. and be sensitive to his spirit on that. So it's just very interesting early on in the account in the Bible this going on and um, clearly Satan tempting the serpent. The woman. Well, you're saying the word Satan, but oh, actually yeah. here um, we the know it's the serpent. Tempting yeah. the woman. Yeah. She's listening to what he's saying. Yeah. All right. So um, was what was the woman faced with in these verses? She, she had a clear choice. She was either going to obey God's uh, command or listen to the serpent's lies. Yeah. Simple as that. That was the choice. You know, she that was, going was to, the choice. Was she going to do what God said or was she going to listen to Satan and his lies? And the question, next question, did she know the consequences mm. of her choice? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She did because she told the serpent, didn't she? <laughs> yeah. End you, of verse you, three. You're going to die. Yeah. So she knew the consequences. Yeah. And then, and then the next question, how did she respond? Well, if we go to the end of verse 6, we can see what she did. She actually responded in disobedience. She disobeyed God, didn't she? She listened to what the serpent said because it said she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eye, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. 
And then I think the next question actually is we've been asked to, to circle all the verbs, haven't we? Yeah. So um, what are those verbs? Yeah. So, yes, I'll just read that question out. Circle all the verbs in verse 6 that relate directly to the woman. Mm. Do you see any similarity between the actions that led her to sin, that would be Eve, and the actions that led King David to sin. See lesson one, and if yeah. so, describe. So we'll look at that in a second. So what are the verbs in verse six yeah. that uh, relate um, directly Very to the woman? So the first one would be... Well, a verb is an action word. So what are the action words? So we see in verse six that she saw, that's the first action word, the first verb. And then um, she took, so she took from its fruit, then she ate, and then she gave. So she yeah. saw, she took, she ate, and she gave. Now, if you uh, were to go back to lesson one, if mm -hmm. you've got your book before you, right, I mean, it's the first passage in, in um, lesson one, looking at uh, David and uh, sending out his servants to uh, destroy the sons of Ammon, if you remember that. David stayed at Jerusalem, it says, when evening came, David arose from his bed, walked around on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw... <laughs> A woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful in appearance so David sent and inquired about the woman and one said is this not Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam the wife of Uriah the Hittite David sent messengers and took her and when she came to him he lay with her so in the same way they both saw they both thought gosh this is delightful to my eyes um, with Eve it was the fruit the forbidden fruit with David. It was also forbidden fruit, but it was in the form of Bathsheba. Yep. Uh, they both took yep. and they both ate. They both um, took what was not theirs. And I think, you know, what was so interesting to me was Eve was given God's word via Adam, but David had been given God's word via the Torah that he had to write out. Both mm -hmm. had God's word mm -hmm. and both chose to ignore it. Yep. So I think those are the similarities for me. Yeah. And they've both been warned. They had both been warned. Because David was, you know, somebody said to David, is this not Bathsheba? Mm. You know, she's married. She's a married woman. Yeah. You know, you can't do this. But he ignored that. And uh, so very similar. Yeah. Very similar. Um, starting with the, interesting, starting with the eyes. Mm -hmm. So guys out there, any guys watching? We need to watch what we watch. <laughs> we need to watch what we but watch. But clearly we girls need to too as well. Yeah. Because, um, so, yeah. Okay. So... Uh, moving on, we're going to uh, move on now to Luke chapter 4 and the first 13 verses of Luke chapter 4. So we're going to read these verses. Uh, we're going to mark references to Jesus with a cross. Uh, we're going to mark the devil with a pitchfork. And we are going to put a box around the phrase, it is written or it is said. So three different types of markings, quite a lot of marking in these verses. So I'm going to read really slowly so you can uh, go through. Uh, Luke 4, chapters, uh, verses 1 to 13. Jesus, the devil, and it is written or it is said. Here we go. Jesus, so put your cross over Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. So this is our pitchfork. And he, he Jesus, ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended... He, he became hungry. And the devil said devil. to him, Jesus, if you, you Jesus, are the Son of God, Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus, Jesus answered him. That's the devil. It is written. So put your box around that phrase. It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone. And he, the devil, he led him, Jesus, up and showed him, that's Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Top of page 53, verse 6. And the devil said, devil, to him, to Jesus, I, I the devil, will give you, you, Jesus, all this domain and its glory for it has been handed over to me marking me there oh sorry yes i'm quite right and i i 
give it to whomever I, I wish. Therefore, verse 7, if you, you that would be Jesus, worship before me, Nige, the devil, it shall be yours. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus answered him, him, the devil, it is written. So that's your phrase again, so put your box around it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Verse 9, and he led him. So he, the devil, led Jesus. To Jerusalem and had him stand him. on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him. Jesus. If you Jesus. are the son of God. So you mark son of God there. Throw yourself down from here. Yourself. Page 54, verse 10. For it is written. That's your box again. He will command his angels concerning you, you to guard you. You. And on their hands they will bear you up. You, Jesus. So that you, you. will not strike your foot against your. the stone. Verse 12. And Jesus, Jesus answered and said to him. Him, the devil. It is said. So put your box around that as well. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil, devil. had finished every temptation, he, he left him, him until an opportune time. Okie dokie. Right, let's go through these verses. So, first question, what do you learn from marking Jesus in this passage? So lots, lots of markings of, here, aren't there? Yeah, there are. So we see that Jesus had been at the Jordan and being filled with the Holy Spirit, he was full of the Spirit, he was being led by the Spirit in the wilderness, that's verse 1. And he was there for a period of 40 days being tempted for that time by the devil. And uh, he ate nothing. So he became hungry. So we just see that, um, yeah. Jesus' humanity. Yeah, we do see his so, humanity, absolutely. Yeah. Filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit, tempted by the devil, um, but not eating. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you learn from marking the devil? Uh, the devil tempted Jesus, didn't he? He 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 kind of picked on his weakness in a sense. You know, it, it ends at verse two saying that Jesus became hungry, yeah. and then the devil immediately kind of attacks him at that weak point mm. um, by saying. You know, um, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Yeah. You know, just tempting him. Yeah. So we learn that the, that the devil can speak, actually, uh, because he spoke to Jesus, and he's a tempter. Yeah, he's a tempter. And, and I think your point is very valid there about uh, a point of weakness. You, you imagine not eating for 40 days. I mean, you hear about hunger strikers, and, uh, you know, and so here's Jesus in the wilderness, starving, hungry, and the first thing that, that uh, we see in, this, in the scripture that Satan does is tempt him at his point of greatest mm. need. Mm. And for me, you know, he doesn't play fair. He doesn't play, you know, he doesn't say, oh, you know, I'll have some food, revive yourself, get strong, and then I'll, I'll put a temptation. No, he just, you know, he doesn't play fair. And I think that's something that we need to recognize as well. He does not play fair. Mm. Um, so. So he's, he's trying to engage Jesus in a, in a conversation, actually, mm. and uh, I guess like he did with Eve. Um, and uh, we also see that he, he led Jesus and, and um, took him around to show him. Different places. Yeah. Okay, we'll look at that more in, in, in just a mm -hmm. second. So what was, the, what was the devil doing to Jesus? First question. Well, I think I've just, we've just kind of answered both yeah. of these, actually. Had he done this to anyone before and who was the first one? So... Yeah, he had temp he was tempting Jesus. He was yeah. he was tempting him and he tempted Eve. Um, so same tactic, exactly the same. Yeah, okay. Top of page fifty three. We're gonna read through the passage one more time and we're gonna number off the temptations that the devil set forth. Uh, we're then gonna discuss each temptation, uh, being sure to talk about Jesus' response each time. Yeah. All right, so Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. The devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, tell this stone 
to become bread. So that's our first temptation there. So I'm going to put a big number one in the margin. Yep. Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. He led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory. For it has been handed over to me and I will give it to whomever I wish. Second temptation. Uh, tempting Jesus with all of the domain. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He led him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So I actually have put a number three against um, verse, nine. verse nine. Yeah. Um, but it's nine, 10 and 11, isn't it? Jesus answered and said to him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, so we are to discuss each, each of these. Temptations. Yeah. So we've begun to discuss a little bit, the first one, in that Jesus was human and he was hungry and um, Satan was, uh, the devil was saying, you know, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And you know, it's really interesting because he's speaking to Jesus. And I think um, what he's actually saying is, prove yourself. You know, you can, you can get yourself out of this problem very easily by proving your divinity and turning these stones into bread. And uh, just show me, just show me. And so, um, yeah, that's what he's doing, isn't it? It's, he, he's, he's trying to, um, he's saying, since you are, it's that sort of needling, since you are the son of God, just prove yourself. Mm. Yeah. Make bread. So the word if there, because it says, if you are the son of God, you did some, a little bit of background work yeah, on that. Yeah, I think what, what that's saying actually is that, you know. So it's, not, it's not putting a it's question. It's not question, mark. no, it's not questioning. He's actually, because Satan was created. We know, we know that from, we've just read that the serpent um, was um, made by the Lord God. Yeah. So he knows, he, he, knows, he knows who Jesus is. Yeah. Um, uh, there's no problem with that. But he's actually getting him to prove it. Yeah. Um, or yeah. wants him to, to do something that he shouldn't do to prove it. Mm. Rather yeah. than, because he's, remember, Jesus is being led by the Spirit. He's just been filled with the Spirit. He's been to the Jordan. He's been filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. He's been led by the Spirit. And so he, he's trying to get Jesus to do something that is not Spirit-led. And so Jesus is saying, no. Yeah, and he responds, Jesus responds with the Word of God, it is written. And so, yeah, we're going to talk about that in, in just a second, but yeah. you're absolutely right, it is written, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's the first one. Uh, tempting Jesus at his point of greatest need, mm -hmm. um, with his hunger. Second one. Second one, verse six. Uh, Satan says, I'll give you all this domain and its glory. You know, he had shown Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, mm -hmm. verse five tells us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I can give it to whoever I wish. And in a sense, he's, you know, he's absolutely right. He has dominion, or had dominion, has dominion, over all the worlds. Because when, when Adam and Eve sinned, they gave up their um, rule and authority of, of the land. They were banished from the garden. Um, and Jesus, now, of course God's always sovereign, but that was temporarily handed over to Satan. He is the power of the prince of the air. So he could have handed it over to Jesus because he wanted to be worshipped. Verse 7 tells us that Satan's motive was to be worshipped. He, he wants to be God. God. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so... And that's pride, that's pride, isn't it? It, it is, pride. total pride, absolutely. Yeah. Taking yeah. the place of God. Yeah. And again, Jesus responds. With the word written. of God, yeah. Yeah. And then the third one, verse nine, uh, mm. Satan leads Jesus to stand on the, the pinnacle, the, the um, pinnacle of the temple, and um, just says, if you throw yourself down, uh, it is written. Uh, then he's, he, he starts quoting scripture. You know, God's not going to let you get hurt. Mm. He's going to send his angels to guard you. So nothing's going to happen. Prove yourself. 
Yeah. Okay, so those are the three temptations that we have seen. The next question is, um, how did the devil change his tactic with the third temptation? And why do you think that was? So what was different about the third temptation? Mm. And this is where, you know, the it is written really help us to see. Mm. So um, as, as you have quite rightly said in verse four, Jesus responded um, to Satan um, with the word of God, um, both in verse four and in verse eight. Yep. But we see in verse 10, Satan now starts quoting scripture to Jesus. <laughs> so why do you think he does that? Um, Jesus had responded to Satan with the word of God mm -hmm. through the previous two temptations. And I think maybe he just thought, well, okay, you're, you're using scripture against me. I'm going to use scripture against you. Mm. Um, it's interesting. Have you ever been in a conversation where somebody uses scripture um, and you know they're not a believer and uh, and that they use it in a way that's kind of un trying to be underhand about something. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it's just interesting. This is one of Satan's tactics, uh, just speaking scripture back. Yeah. But Jesus is having none of it. Um, mm. So, yeah. I remember, this is a bit of an aside here, I remember getting an email once from a person who was promising me a million pounds. And it was, uh, it was, all of scripture. Do you remember that? Mm, it was quite very quite It was a scam. It's when scams first started coming out, about oh. 15, 16 years ago. I got this email. I thought, my goodness me, I'm going to get a million pounds there. And there was scripture all over it and talk about, you know, being tempted. And uh, it, it was a lie. It was an absolute lie and it was a scam. But they were, it was using scripture mm. for, for, for their evil ends. purposes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. absolutely. So I think he, he was trying to, you know, why was he doing that? He, he was using Jesus' tactics because I think he was trying to force Jesus to respond to him. He wanted Jesus um, to respond to him, yeah. do what he said. Okay, so um, according to verse 13, had the devil Ooh, given I up? I think, I think, how did Jesus oh. respond to this? Is Sorry, yes, how did how Jesus do you respond, respond to, to the third temptation yeah. and what Satan mm. said to him? So yeah. verse 12, Jesus then came back with more scripture and said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Yeah. Just dealt with it, yeah. straight out. Okay, so that's enough. According to verse 13, had the devil given up on tempting Jesus? Nope. How do we know that? So it tells us in verse 13. Yeah, end of verse 13. He left him, Jesus, until an opportune time. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. You can resist Satan, the temptations of the devil today, with what he brings against us. And we can say, no, not having it. Um, but Satan doesn't meet with that, does he? I think. He, he will come back and try again, maybe when we're weak and feeling, you know, hungry and tired and all those things so all right what did you learn from comparing the way that Eve responded to the devil's temptation with how Jesus handled it why did one succeed and the other fail remember that the Bible says that Jesus was a man who was tempted in all ways just as we are mm. you see that in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 so Eve so. just got into a dialogue, didn't she, um, with, with um, the serpent, and she didn't hold on to the word of God, whereas mm. Jesus spoke out God's word, and crucially, he obeyed it. So he rehearsed the word of God, and he did what the, God said, what, what, what the word of God said to him. So um, he, he spoke God's word, yeah. held firm to that. Yeah. Okay, so two different contrasting responses to temptation yeah. there. So is there anything that we learned personally from these last two passages about dealing with temptation and making choices? If so, describe how this will guide you in the future. Mm. That's very personal, isn't it? Um, yeah. But just looking back, it is written, Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone. An application is, you know, I need to remember that it's not just my physical needs. Um, I need to make sure that I live my life according to God's word. God's word actually is number one. And number two, who am I worshipping? You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You know, I need to make sure that I'm worshipping the Lord. 
not my lusts, things that I want. You know, we saw that Ad uh, that Eve saw, she took, she ate, and she gave. Yeah. So what for am I worshipping? Yeah, for me, it's um, the first thing is that when te temptation comes along, we do not have to submit to temptation. We can resist the temptation, and we resist it uh, with two weapons. One is the Word of God, and the other is the Spirit of God, because we see here that, that, that Jesus was led by the Spirit mm -hmm. in the wilderness. So if we have the Word of God and we have the Spirit of God, then when temptation comes along, we can call on that Word that the Spirit will remind us of in that circumstance, and we can absolutely resist that temptation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I would encourage you to... Uh, for me, there's a, there's, a particular, there's a great scripture, Proverbs 5.21, the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord. He watches all his paths. So the Lord brought that verse to me some time ago, and uh, when I'm tempted, I'm, the Spirit brings that verse back to my mind, that actually my ways are before his eyes. In other words, you know, there's nowhere I can go, there's nothing I can do without God seeing it. Uh, and so when I recognize that and I know that, then um, by his spirit, um, one is able to you know, resist that temptation when it comes. Mm, be led by um, the spirit. So the word and the spirit. Yeah. Well, you know, I think we've probably got to that point in the book where we need to just leave it for this week. Yeah. But uh, it'd be great to have your comments um, and to hear how you, um, what the Lord's saying to you, any insights that you have, mm -hmm. things that we have missed that we haven't talked about, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Um, and Zach, so are there any comments or is there anything that you wish to comment about this week? <laughs> um, the, uh, Becky and Robin have both checked in um, to say hi. Great to see you. Um, specifically for me, I felt, um, we read in uh, Genesis chapter three, verses two to three, uh, that Eve, Eve had everything to choose from. She had like an abundance of God's creation and uh, she got tempted by the one one tree which, which led to sin. But then if we compare and contrast that with page 54 uh, and verse 13, uh, here we have the devil has every temptation for sin available to him, but he only wanted one thing, which was to see Jesus fail. Mm. And it just shows uh just goes to show the um the emptiness of sin and how uh deception led eve to the one thing that in fact uh had most of the emptiness in the whole garden but was made to look the most valuable mm. so yeah great mm. insight <laughs> so she chose the empty and gave up what was the important the important yeah. uh, but jesus stood firm and didn't do that mm. He broke that pattern and uh, thanks that's a great insight we'd love to hear your insights please yeah, put and them maybe yeah please and, put and, them up. and you know if you're in a group watching this um, you know after the after it finishes then discuss amongst yourselves maybe some of the things that the temptations that you're dealing with be honest with each other be open with each other you can pray for each other mm. you know that's the great thing about being a small group we can be accountable and be real um, and uh, you know the Lord wants what's best for us. He knows what's best for us, and uh, we're going to see uh, as we carry on next week um, when we start looking at two Timothy three sixteen seventeen what the place of the Word of God is in that. So I would just encourage you to yeah to be honest, to share with each other, to pray for each other, um, so that we can uh, stand up, resist the devil. But I think the Word of God and the Spirit of God are the two key weapons, if you like in order to enable us to do that. So thank you so much for joining us today. We love to hear your comments, even if the program's finished, you know, you can post them later um, and uh, hear how you're getting on. It's a great encouragement to us. Uh, I hope it's been an encouragement to you today to go through this book, How to Make Choices You Won't Regret. And don't forget, you can join us at our Preset Bible School. Details of that are on the website, preset.org.uk. Um, you can book into, um, we've one, got one coming up in the next few weeks, but um, we have three throughout the year. So you can book onto any one of those courses. Yeah. And don't forget also, you might not know this, but um, we also put out a podcast as well. Uh, we interview interesting people with 
um, really fascinating stories and uh, it's all about their journey of faith but really how they engage with God through studying his word and of course as a ministry that's our um, that's our mission we want to help people engage with the word with God through um, studying his word anyway thank you for being with us and uh, look forward to being with you again God bless you bye for now